Good morning. I'm Gregory Johnson, minister of the Shelby Valley Church of Christ. It is so good to be with you this day. Uh, I continually run into my friends and acquaintances and family that I find are tuning in to listen to the sermons. I do these for you. I do these for you. Um, I pray that you that are not my brothers and sisters in Christ will not only be friends and acquaintances, but will become my brothers and sisters in Christ by obeying the gospel. We here at the Shelby Valley Church of Christ are, are thankful that God has blessed us, that we can sponsor this program and put it on uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and WPRG. We've got good friends down there, and I thank them for all they do to help me. And I need help. <laughs> I need help, as most people do. But uh, I want you to continue to remember these flood victims. People are that's sort of getting old news, and people aren't paying attention to them much. I'm mindful of them. And there's still a lot of people that are suffering, not even in their own home still, uh, We've got a lot of people in campers at various places over eastern Kentucky. And those people want to be back in their home, most of them anyway. So let's continue to be mindful of them. And uh, uh, we are going to try to set some times here at the Shelby Valley Church of Christ, U.S. 23 South, 10334 Caney Highway. Uh, we're going to try to set some times this coming week. And, and we have some toys and some clothes, coats, caps, and things that we're going to make available to the flood victims or any that are in severe need. Uh, may God bless you to pass this word along and to help others. You may not be in need, but you may know someone that is that was flooded and uh, maybe the kids aren't going to have a, a good Christmas or have gifts, and we do have some toys that we're going to offer to the community and to the flood victims. So... Uh, be listening for that. WPRG, I think, is going to help me get that word out. So be watching. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, in Jesus' precious name, we come before your throne. We thank you so much for Jesus, for his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, and for your, for your love that that shows to mankind how much you love us, Father. And we thank you. We thank you for him. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you through your Son. Father, we ask your blessings on this day. We ask your blessings on everyone that's watching, or everyone that hears this sermon. We ask, Father, that you not only bless them, but you bless their families, Father. Bless them in this time of year when we give gifts and we're mindful of the birth of our Savior. Bless us, Father, that uh, we do remember your love and your gift to us. Father, we ask your blessings on the sick. Brother Mark Sayers is in serious condition. We ask your healing of him. We thank you for the healing you've given our sister Ann Elkins and many others. Uh, bless Brother Edley Newsom with healing, if it be your will. He's in serious condition, Father. You know that. We ask that you heal him, if it be your will. Father, we ask your blessings on our nation and our leaders and leaders throughout the world. Guide them, Father, in righteousness that we might have peace. Bless our leaders to do and say the right things. Father, bless all that I come in contact with my teaching, my preaching, and my life, that I show them your love, Father. Not only show it, but convince them of it, that they would love you in return and obey your commandments and make heaven their home. Father, again, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for Jesus. We ask all these things, and we praise you, Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and amen. The title of the sermon today is Hunger. Now, what comes to mind or what comes to your mind when you think about hunger? Probably the same thing that does to me, food. Or uh, maybe uh, another thought might come to mind of people being hungry in some other country or some third world country. Or even in this country, there's a lot of people that for whatever reason, maybe uh, problems in their life or drugs or whatever it might be, a hardship, that uh, they do not have everything they want to eat, and they go hungry sometimes. 
Uh, and we know that hunger for food is, is a strong desire, but Webster also defines hunger as a strong desire for uh, a strong desire, period. Uh, some people hunger after wealth or hunger after knowledge or um, hunger is just a strong desire. People, you might say he, he has a hungry desire to be a great basketball player uh, or he desires great knowledge. He's hungry for it. He wants it. He, he's after it. He's going after it. Uh, but the hunger that we're going to talk about today uh, the Lord speaks of in Matthew 5 and 6. These verses associated with that chapter, quite often people refer to them as the Beatitudes. But in Matthew 5 and 6, it says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, it says hunger and thirst. Well, thirst carries pretty much the same meaning it, too, is a very strong desire uh, for drink or for water, but for other things. He's thirsty for knowledge. Hunger and thirst for food and water in, this, in the physical world uh, are necessary. These two things are necessary for life, food and water. The word righteousness is the focal point in this verse to me from our text. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Just as water and food are necessary for physical life, righteousness through Jesus Christ is necessary for eternal life. If you notice that in our text, it does not say hunger and thirst for righteousness. But it says hunger and thirst after after righteousness now the word after has several meanings but here it carries the meanings of to follow we can see apostle paul uh, use this word in this manner over in second timothy 2 and 22 and i like this scripture and because it carries a lot of meaning and it's should, i hope it's meaningful to you it says flee also useful us timothy was a younger brother in christ and paul uh, being rooted and grounded in the truth, being blessed by God and being a vessel of God, a chosen vessel to carry the word out, he's speaking to this younger brother. He says, flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. With after meaning to follow, let's again look at our text Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Follow after righteousness. In other words, you continue in a righteous manner. You walk righteously. You live righteously. And that is following after righteousness. <clears throat> Follow righteousness. God is righteous. We are to live godly. We are to be holy as he is holy. Peter tells that, us that in the first chapter of 1 Peter. God, inspiring Peter to write this, says, Be ye holy as I am holy. So we know what God tells us. And, you know, if you want to go in there and read that first chapter of Peter, it is a wonderful chapter. Uh, a lot of information given. It ends with, but the, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So where do you get the water, word of God? In the preaching of the gospel. That's what I'm to give to you is God's word. Now, not everyone that stands before you, they give you parts of God's word. The devil stood before Adam and Eve and as I was talking to a, uh, an acquaintance of mine the other day. Uh, he stood before Adam and Eve and he quoted God's word verbatim except he added a word in. God said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Satan comes along, uses God's word, but adds something in it, changes its meaning. He says, you shall not surely die. So we've got to be careful. Every word, everyone that is speaking God's word is not speaking it in truth. I can 
attest to that because I listen to other people. I listen to some of these people on TV giving you the plan of salvation. Just pray this prayer with me. That's not biblical. That's not from the Bible. That's not God's word. That's man telling you to do that. I tell you what the word says. You go in and read Acts 2.38 and see what Peter told them on the day of Pentecost. He didn't say pray this prayer with me and you'll be all right. No, he did not. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. How do you get rid of sins? By being the gospel. And the, the part of that, not the final part, the, one of the final parts is to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins. Then we must rise and walk faithful unto death. That is, and then we'll be, the next thing is we will be in judgment. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. Hebrews 9 and 27. Now, I like to, when I can, give you scripture, uh, book and verse, book, chapter, and verse for the things I tell you, just as that was Hebrews 9 27. I want you to read that and verify that what I'm telling you is truth. It's God's word. But now I can tell you everything you hear in the uh, people professing to be religious or preaching the gospel are not preaching the gospel. They're not preaching it according to the word. They're taking things that man has introduced into religion, and they're preaching that to you. Now, somewhere they got off track, and the devil is in the mix. He's behind it. There's only two forces at work, good and evil. And some people are carried along with the evil, thinking they're doing good, but they're not. The, but the word is here to guide you. The word is here to guide you. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. God has inspired his word for you and for me. And we can go in and read it for ourselves. I want you to follow up on the things I tell you because I want you to know that I spend my time and my effort to preach the gospel to help you and to be of service to God and my Savior. So following after righteousness is important. We're to be holy as he is holy. Uh, Living righteous, following after righteousness. <clears throat> and that begins with knowledge, as I was just talking about. And knowledge comes from the hearing of God's word. You verify what I tell you. You verify what other people tell you. And see what you need to do. You better be doing the will of God. Not everyone that calls, saying to me, Lord, Lord, I shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can call on the Lord. That don't mean you're going to heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. That is Matthew 7 and 21. Read that for yourself. Because everybody's not going. Just because you call on the name of the Lord, just because you profess to be religious, doesn't mean you're doing the will of the Father. And that's where I want to help you. I want to help myself by going into the Word, and I have. And I want to help you by going into the Word and verifying what you believe, what you practice in a in a religious organization, is it according to God's word? Because God will accept his word. I hope, I hope and I believe it from the depths of my heart. I love my fellow man. I don't want anyone lost. But I, I tell people, I hope everyone makes heaven. But I'm not their judge. You're going to be judged with this word. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The words I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. That is John 12 and 48. Go read it for yourself. Right there are several important verses. He goes on down the last couple of verses and says the things that the Father had given him to speak, so I speak. He gave me a, cam a commandment, he says. But read that for yourself, and you'll see that it says what I'm telling you. So how we live is important, and it all comes with knowledge and the knowledge of God's word, and God has given his word so we can have knowledge, so we can have understanding. It's important what you hear and how you react to it and what you believe, what you practice in your life, how you live your life. What are you following after? You're following after the ways of the devil, the ways of man, which are the ways of the devil, or are you following after God's word? <clears throat> and if we have knowledge, if we've heard the word and, and we believe it, uh, then 
the righteous action on man's part, the right thing to do is to repent, to change. Because I'm not doing my job as a minister of the gospel of Christ if I don't tell you that mankind is in sin. When we come to the age of accountability, whatever age that is for various people, you, when you know sin in, in context of the word and the loss of your soul, then you're accountable. And once you're accountable, you're in sin. And you have those sins till you obtain remission of those sins, forgiveness of those sins. And so once we hear the word and we have knowledge that we're in a lost state, well, we don't want there, we don't want to miss heaven, we don't want to go to hell. So the, the intelligent reaction to hearing the word is that you, want to ch you know you need to change, and so you decide or you want to change. You want repentance. You're going to do things right from then on. You're going to follow after righteousness. And so you're going to stop sinning. You're going to confess Jesus as the Son of God, as the, Phil, as the Ethiopian eunuch did, and then you will be buried with Jesus in baptism. That is such a special thing. People make light of it or even deny it, but it is such a special thing. We are buried with him in baptism. Roman, uh, Paul tells the Romans in Romans 6, 3 and 4. Read it for yourself. Then it says in verse 5, if you've been planted together, together, you're not by yourself, you're with the Lord. If you're planted together in the likeness of his death, you shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. What was that likeness of his resurrection? Jesus had done the will of the Father. He had gone to the cross for you and I, and he had gone to the grave, and he had risen. When we come out of that watery grave, we have risen from the sinful life that we're in, and now we're a new creature. The Bible says so. So we're buried with him in baptism for the remission of our sins. <clears throat> but righteousness does not end there. <clears throat> we must... As I read in, in Apostle Paul's instruction to young Timothy, we must follow after righteousness, continue in it. We must continue in our faith and in our, in our love and, and peace uh, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, I want you to have that pure heart. I want to have that pure heart. I'm striving to do that and trying to do the will of God. Going to all the world and preach the gospel, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do that this morning to help you. Because I love you. I can't have the spirit of God in Christ if I don't love you. Because God is love. And love is of God. And we must have that spirit. We must care about our fellow man. Now we don't, we don't like our fellow man's sinful ways. We can't do that. We can't follow after sin. We must follow after righteousness. And that is to try to get the word out to those that have not obeyed. That they will. And try to get the word out to those that have obeyed. That they will stray strong in the word. Stay strong in their, in their life. Follow after, follow after righteousness. So we want them to do that. So the path of righteousness is important for us. It, it is the way that a Christian lives. It is what a Christian person is like. Uh, I know many of my brothers and sisters here have such a good heart. They've, they've given of their life. They've given of their time to help in this flood work. They did months ago when we passed out tractor trailer loads of goods to people. They were here to help them load it and, and, and to help them on their way, to help them to recovery. And, and we have many good brothers and sisters. I see it in their prayers for the sick and prayers for each other. So we must continue in righteousness. Uh, it is a, it is a, as a Christian, as we follow after righteousness, it's a life of hope and joy and peace in an otherwise hopeless and cruel world. And it seems to be getting more so corrupt and cruel all the time. I, feel, I, I sympathize and I, I fear for these young people growing up. Um, I see these little children, four and five, six-year-old, just so innocent. And the world is getting so vile. We're getting more like Sodom and Gomorrah every day. Just without God and without hope. I hope that we can preach the word. I hope that if you're a Christian, you raise your children and teach them the right things and teach them God's word. And if you're not a Christian, you need to be thinking about it. It's not only your soul that's at risk. It's your children and your grandchildren. Are you going to teach them truth or are you going to go along with whatever somebody says 
and never confirm it in the Word. You have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to know what God's Word says. And if I do, I better be doing it. And so should you, and I want to encourage you in that. That's why I preach. That's why I teach. You are important to me. You're important to God, which is more important. But you're important to me, and you're important to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You just think what he did for you. Just think of being laid back and nails driven in your hands and in your feet and a crown of thorns pushed down on your head. You know, I did a, a sermon one time on the, a thorn. I was working out clearing some brush, and I got a thorn prick in my finger. It evidently was very deep because I'd never have one hurt me like that. And I was sitting there, and I thought, Lord, that was only one thorn. What did the Lord go through for me? What did he go through for you? Having that crown of thorns pushed down on his head, and I've seen those thorns in Israel. They're about that long. And so you make a platter a crown out of them and shove it down on your head and I, I just can't imagine if I know what one little blackberry thorn or something hurts in me, what would that hurt like? But that's just a part of the suffering he went through. When I pray, I thank Jesus for the stripes he took. Peter says those stripes, by his stripes you were healed. The suffering he endured brought salvation to me and to you if you will accept his word and obey the gospel. He died for you. That's how much he loves you. Jesus and our Savior and God, our Father, love us. Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 and 12, and you might wonder why this is, but let's talk about that just a second. Yea, and all that will live godly, following after righteousness, shall suffer persecution. Hmm. I thought everything, some people think everything's going to go smooth when you become a Christian. It's not. You're going to suffer persecution. You, you're going to have people look down on you for being a Christian. You're going to have maybe even people talk about you for being a Christian. And it's getting to, I hope I, that we can continue our religious freedom in this country, but sometimes I wonder if that will always be. But we're going to suffer persecution. Uh, why? Because through our obedience... We have become children of God. And yes, we as children will as men suffer persecution and trials. But if we stay faithful, we're bringing glory to God. You, gotta, you must come to see the word and know God's truth and know that we're going to have trials. But those trials draw us closer to God. They, they make us more precious in his sight because we have survived those. We have stayed faithful even under this persecution. The Lord stayed faithful unto death, and so must we. And we must suffer persecution. We, hopefully we will never have to surf, suffer the persecution that our Lord did. But we too will have problems as Christian people. But we, we need to be mindful of who we are. And what we're following after. Those in sin also suffer persecution. But who do they have to turn to? They have no one. They have no one. They're on their own. We have God whose eyes are over us. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. If you're not a Christian, you need to think about that scripture. That is 1 Peter 3 and, 15, 3 and 12. Excuse me. 3 and 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. The implication there, of course, is but the face of him is against them that do evil. Uh, God listens to his children. Now, he knows other people praying, but he's not going to answer their prayer. He's not going to answer their prayer because they don't care enough to do his will. They don't care. They want things, but they're not willing to give him their love, to give him their obedience. Yeah, we all want things, but do we want to please God? That's the greatest want we should have, is to please God. We have hope. We have hope of eternal, uh, of eternity with God. That's one thing when we're in the depths, when there are depths of persecution, the depths of trials, the depths of trouble. We need to realize that who we are, never forget who we are. We're a son or a daughter of God if we have obeyed the gospel. 
We're his children. And all things will work together for good to them that love the Lord. So even though it's bad, it's going to get better. And it's never going to be eternally wrong because you are never alone. You're never alone. Once you become a Christian, the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself are in you. I will walk in them and they will be my people. So we know that God is with us and we're not alone anymore. We that live righteous, God's children, we can endure. We can be victorious over the trials and the tribulations because we believe what Paul wrote to the in his writings to the uh, uh, the Philippians, excuse me, there's some scripture in Corinthians we could use here too, but this is in Philippians uh, 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Where's your strength come from? From Jesus Christ. We know the suffering he went through and he endured it. We can endure it. We have, we have the example set before us. Uh, uh, the uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name. I remember reading about this. I think in the eighth grade, the first guy man that ever broke the four minute mile. No one had broken it. No one had run a four minute mile. This guy started out. He was injured, and they told him he wouldn't walk. But he got to walk, and he got to running, and finally, he came along and he broke the four minute mile. They said it couldn't be done, but he did. Then once he had broken it, once he had broken it, several men came along and broke the four-minute mile. I mean, shortly thereafter, because they know it could be done. We know that we can endure because our Savior endured. He overcome, and so can we overcome. Because we have the Spirit of God in Christ in us. We believe that, that Jesus lives in us. We believe what John wrote in John 1 and 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I love that. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We're never alone. We're strong in Christ Jesus, as long as we're mindful, as long as we're following after righteousness. We as us children must never be, mind, be mindful of what we hunger for. Must ever be mindful, excuse me. We must always remember what we're hungering for. We're following after righteousness. We need to be mindful of that. And be vigilant, as, as Peter says. We're to be sober. We're, we're to be seriously minded about our faith and about our life. We're to be sober. We're to be vigilant on guard. Because your adversary, the devil, who's your adversary? The devil. If you're going to God's children, he's trying to pull you back out into the world. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh, walketh about seeking whom he might devour. The devil is among us. The devil's on this earth and influencing people, influencing situations to try to bring you away from God if you're one of his children. So we've got to be serious. We've got to be following after righteousness and be careful and not get off of track of what we're doing and how we're living our life. It says, whom resist, verse 9, this is 1 Peter 5 and 8, I just quoted, verse 9 says, whom resist steadfast in the faith, seeing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You mean a brother can do something wrong? Well, certainly they can. Certainly they can. The devil's at work. Peter wouldn't be warning us to be on guard if he couldn't do anything to us. You know he can't. Satan was in heaven himself, but he's cast out. We've not made heaven yet. And we certainly can, can fall away. There's too many examples of it in Scripture. Too many examples. And yet there are people who say you can't. I don't, I don't mean to differ with them. I'm just telling you what the Word says. The Word says you can't. And, and this Scripture here would be telling you to be on guard if you didn't have to be afraid of anything. You do. The devil's at work. He's busy at his work, as the old lady said. <clears throat> the unrighteous, the sinner, they that are hungering, what are they hungering for? What are the sinners? They're hungering for things of this world. They're hungry for things that bring 
pleasure of the flesh. But <clears throat> we've got to be hungry for the bread of life, for God's word. And that's what I want for you. You've heard the word this morning. God loves you. Jesus died for you. You can have salvation through him, through your obedience, by hearing, believing, repenting of your sins, confessing him as the son of God, and being buried with him in baptism. That's what I want for you. And that's what this congregation and all churches of Christ members want for you. They want you to have salvation. We are the body of Christ. Christ is in us, and we're in Christ. We want you to be also. May Think on these things. Read it and follow after the scripture I've given you. May God bless you to do his will. I love you. And may you have a wonderful day. God bless you.